so before we start the topic most of you must have seen this movie this is american sniper uh, bradley cooper was the hero of that movie now i am not saying the gastroenterologist is the sniper or the surgeon is the sniper the reason why i have why i have kept this slide is you know this slide tells you the essence of today's talk the sniper before he shoots he finds a vantage point number 1 number 2 he identifies confirms his victim or the kill it is called kill third is he should know what is his equipment what is the range what kind of bullets is he going to use plus he has to check the humidity the temperature the air velocity the direction of air and for long range shots also has to take into account the gravity because the bullet is going to slow down and take a curve downward so like a sniper you know he takes multiple things into account while tackling proximal biliary cancers we have to take multiple things into account rather than just shooting like gunjan said that do not put stents before a staging is complete so even for a surgeon there are multiple things to be analyzed before a decision is taken so we have to confirm the diagnosis we have to have accurate staging we have to have multidisciplinary team discussion with the radiologist with the pathologist interventional radiologist we need to discuss whether there is need for tissue diagnosis what is the medical fitness of the patient if we are going to drain the patient pre operatively uh, what is the aim of our biliary drainage why are we doing it what is the method that we are going to use antibiotics either pre drainage or peri operative whether we should give blood transfusion whether patient needs new adjuvant and many of these things will be discussed in uh, uh, today's uh, seminar so this is just basic and lot of it has been already covered gallbladder cancer is the commonest biliary cancer and cholangiocarcinoma is divided into intrahepatic perihilar and distal cholangio distal cholangio is after the cystic duct joins and forms the common bile duct and perihilar is or hilar is basically the confluence and the bifurcation of the bile duct now this classification is also covered the famous bismuth correlate classification of course this is a classification but it is not a staging of the disease staging tnm staging is different and morphologically hilar cholangiocarcinoma are either mass forming or periductal infiltrating or intraductal variety so when we see these patients clinically the first difference between these two is that the peak age for gallbladder cancer is around 50 although in high risk areas like northern india we should remember that the risk starts at the age of 30 so it's not 50 the risk starts at the age of 30 but it will peak at the age of 50 whereas hilar cholangiocarcinoma are more common in elderly people now at present jaundice is seen in almost 90% of hilar cholangiocarcinoma in fact jaundice and weight loss could be the presenting feature whereas gallbladder cancers most of the times are incidentally detected either the patient comes with biliary colic sonography is done for stones and either early stage gb cancer is incidentally detected or more commonly surgery is done for acute cholecystitis and in the specimen a gallbladder cancer is detected uh, cholangitis is seen in less than 20% of the hilar cholangiocarcinomas provided you have not done any intervention cholangitis is very common in any kind of intervention either endoscopic or a percutaneous biliary drainage next thing is in carcinoma gallbladder the gallbladder may be pul pulpable but in hilar cholangiocarcinoma pulpable gallbladder goes against the diagnosis because it's a hilar structure so the gallbladder will not become over distended like a lower cbd uh, biliary obstruction another thing that we see in clinical examination is whether the hepatomegaly is asymmetric because like uh, you heard in the previous talk there could be lower atrophy if one sided portal vein is involved that side liver could be 
shrunken or there is crowding of biliary radicals but on clinical examination it will be evident as asymmetric hepatomegaly in some patients you may find ascites if there is advanced disease or if patients have portal hypertension like a primary sclerosing cholangitis patient you will find splenomegaly but apart from hilar cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer involving the hilum there are many other differential diagnoses so clinically we have to think of metastatic lymph nodes at porta where there is a post operative stricture in a patient who has undergone cholecystic uh, cholecystectomy whether it's a merezy syndrome especially for gallbladder cancer presence of primary sclerosing cholangitis a known primary sclerosing cholangitis it is often very dif difficult to decide whether there is cholangiocarcinoma or no cholangiocarcinoma igg4 disease is nowadays more and more commonly detected earlier we were not aware of this condition so probably we were missing some of these uh, patients and they were labeled as idiopathic uh, benign strictures of the hilum tuberculosis is one important cause in india another cause commonly seen in india is portal cavernoma cholangiopathy earlier it was called as portal biliopathy but most of these patients there is clear cut portal cavernoma and many of them have had gi bleeding and endotherapy earlier so ca99 is one commonly done uh, investigation but the thing is that if the patient already has jaundice or some element of cholangitis it will always be elevated so borderline elevation of ca99 in presence of jaundice is not diagnostic so overall the sensitivity ranges from 50 to 90% and specificity from 54 to 98% many other malignancies like hcc pancreatic tumors gastric tumors ovarian tumors may also give rise to rise in ca99 one important thing is like i said in psc if there is a progressive stricture then ca99 of more than 129 is quite sensitive as well as specific to diagnose cholangiocarcinoma so first uh, thing is always imaging and uh, we have seen sonography we have seen contrast ct we, we have seen mri uh pet ct we will discuss something about endoscopic ultrasound now endoscopic ultrasound uh, uh the diagnostic accuracy for, for distal uh, biliary obstruction is far more than proximal biliary obstruction in distal biliary obstruction fnac and uh, the visual diagnosis reaches nearly 100% but in proximal biliary cancers the accuracy goes to 80% secondly in patients who are resectable there are many centers who avoid putting a needle into the mass because there is a risk of seeding from the tumor but they may take samples if there is uh, you know lymph nodes beyond hepatodiodenal ligament to get a tissue diagnosis and confirm that there are involved lymph nodes which are which is considered metastatic and the patient is unresectable uh the surgeons will also decide whether a la diagnostic laparoscopy is necessary before a surgery because up to 20% of the patients may show tiny peritoneal deposits which are missed on all other investigations so the whole role of imaging in a patient with the uh, hilar stricture or hilar cholangiocarcinoma is number 1 to to delineate exact extent of the disease second is to know whether there is a vascular invasion like you have seen in the previous lecture whether there is main portal vein or branch or arterial involvement also look for hepatic atrophy and distant metastasis now in a patient with potentially resectable lesion a cholangiocarcinoma histological confirmation should not be considered mandatory that's the recommendation however there are some patients where there is history of biliary surgery there is history of psc so either the surgeon or the gi physician is reluctant to straight away proceed to surgery 
sometimes the patient or the family do not want to take the risk of a major surgery before a histologic confirmation also if there is chemotherapy and or radiotherapy plan the oncologists always insist on a histopathological diagnosis and then there are attempts made to have a tissue diagnosis sometimes the imaging itself may make you suspect whether it is igg4 disease and in that case again you should not jump on to operating before making an attempt to have a tissue diagnosis so there are multiple methods of doing getting a tissue diagnosis uh, first is brush cytology done during ercp second is there are intraductal biopsy forceps so under fluoroscopic guidance you can introduce the forceps reach the stricture and take a biopsy one can add to the tissue that you get by either brush or intraductal biopsy one can do fluorescent in situ hybridization but that's not commonly available endoscopic ultrasound and fna as i said if there is resectable tumor generally hyalur strictures eus guided fna of the tumor is avoided but you can do uh, lymph node aspiration especially if they are beyond the hepatoduodenal ligament now confocal laser endomicroscopy a very tiny uh, probe is introduced into the bile duct and you can get black and white images like a uh, microscopic pictures of cells but it is not commonly available it is quite expensive so currently brush cytology and intraductal biopsy remain the common ways of achieving tissue diagnosis now um, cholangioscopy one can put a very tiny cholangioscope through the ercp scope into the bile duct observe the stricture take biopsies and increase the accuracy of the diagnosis now generally brush cytology accuracy is around 40% so 60% of the times even if there is malignancy you will not pick it up if you add intraductal biopsy the accuracy goes to around 60% uh if you do a cholangioscopy and biopsy the accuracy goes to around 80% eus fna is again 80% but more important is the appearance the visual appearance of the stricture on cholangioscopy that has highest ac accuracy it exceeds 90% and what do you see on the imaging is the vascular pattern the morphology the fronds of the tissue the friability that you see and it is different for a mass forming uh, cholangiocarcinoma infiltrating cholangiocarcinoma and intraductal cholangiocarcinoma but the visual uh, impression is far more accurate than the biopsy it exceeds 90% another investigation which is not commonly available is intraductal ultrasound so once you do an ercp and you put a guide wire into the biliary tree and then put the intraductal ultrasound probe over that and in the picture on the left side you can see a polypoid tumor inside the uh bile duct in the picture on the right side you can see uh, generalized thickening hypoechoic wall thickening one can see shouldering and always the extent given by intraductal ultrasound is far more than the extent which is seen on uh, other imaging modalities the risk is that if you want to enter every uh, you know right anterior duct posterior duct left side then the you increase the risk of cholangitis and all these segments will have to be drained after the procedure so criteria for unresectability are already discussed by uh, our radiology colleague they will again be discussed by the surgeon so i will not go there so we go to what is the impact of resectability on survival and why we should spend lot of energy and time in accurate staging of the disease so overall if you take hyalur cholangiocarcinomas around 25% will be resectable 75% at the diagnosis will be unresectable if patient has r0 resection the survival five year survival could be around 40% metastatic disease or unresectable 
the survival ranges from uh, three to five months to 13 months and overall fire is only 7%. Gallbladder cancer, on the other hand, overall fire survival is only 5% because most symptomatic patients become unresectable at diagnosis. And you have seen in the previous uh, talk also, most of the gallbladder cancer images you saw had you know, nodal metastasis or ascites or liver metastasis. So we come to the preoperative biliary drainage. Now, why should you do it? You know, people have been doing biliary drainage for a long time and earlier it was done for every patient. Then we realized that if you do it for every patient, you can cause harm in many patients. So the first uh, question is why we should do it. So in patients who have obstructive jaundice, absence of any bile reaching the small bowel gives rise to a lot of, you know, it's a sequence of events. Number one is there is decrease in the biliary IgA secretion. So there is bacterial growth in the overgrowth in the intestine. There is increased permeability of the intestine. So more and more bacteria and their endotoxins start entering the circulation. There is the reticuloendothelial cell dysfunction. We call it immune dysfunction. The obstruction can also produce liver cell apoptosis, progressive liver dysfunction. And if you are leaving a remnant liver that is polystatic, the regeneration is affected. And that is why the post-op liver failure incidence goes up. Plus, like in any progressive liver disease, there is coagulopathy, there is peripheral vasodilatation. These patients are very, very sensitive to going in renal failure in the perioperative period, they also are prone to getting hypotension. So if you see all this, then you will say, why not do it for everybody? Because you are reversing a lot of things. Now, the first thing is that every time we do any kind of biliary drainage, we are also introducing infection into the biliary tree. And the risk of cholangitis is very high. In presence of cholangitis, if the patient undergoes surgery, then the risk of complications is very high. So there are some studies which say not only a risk of infection in the post-op period is high, but even intra-op blood loss is higher if there is a preoperative biliary drainage. So which patients we do? So number one indication is presence of cholangitis and number two, when the functional liver volume of the remnant is considered inadequate. Now, there are different definitions of inadequate uh, remnant volume and the surgeons will throw more light on it. But also if the surgery is delayed due to some reason, patient is malnourished or if new adjuvant therapy is planned or the jaundice is very deep and surgeon is reluctant to resect the liver and leave a functional remnant which is cholestatic, then... Uh, pre-op biliary drainage is done. But like we highlighted earlier in the previous talk and also Gunjan said that we have to think of stenting in a multidisciplinary team meeting. Suppose a gastroenterologist sees the patient next day, he can't put a stent. Okay, because if you do stenting first, then the accuracy of staging process goes down. And there are some studies which prove that your R0 resection rate also goes down if you put a stent before doing accurate staging. Now, how do we drain? So, two standard routes are endoscopic drainage or a percutaneous biliary drainage. Now, endoscopic appears physiological because you are allowing bile to enter the intestine. In the past, people were doing a PTBD and then feeding the patient the bile by Ryle's tube because they realized that draining the bile outside will bring down the jaundice, but it doesn't improve the immune function or intestinal permeability. So in endoscopic, there are two options, either a plastic stain or a nasobiliary drainage catheter. Now, many Japanese units put nasobiliary drainage catheter, but uh, technically, uh, Number one is that the uh, malposition or the catheter slipping down, that risk is there. Secondly, the catheter keeps on coming out through the nose, which is quite uh, irritating for the patient. 
so most of the times plastic states are put in outside japan and nasopilary drainage catheter is put in japanese patients so second thing is should you do a papillotomy because papillotomy adds to the risk of uh, pancreatitis due to ercp and that risk is say 3 to 6% so for pre op drainage if you want to put only plastic stent then the papillotomy may not be necessary third is we have to drain the future remnant lobe and the atrophied lobe there is no point in injecting contrast and then draining it also if you inject contrast in atrophied lobe it is very difficult to take care of that cholangitis lastly it is mandatory to drain the ducts which you opacify so best option is if you decide to drain the right lobe then do not inject contrast till you are beyond the stricture you aspirate the bile and then only inject little contrast to confirm you are above the stricture many patients we are doing only air cholangiogram so just inject 3 to 5 ml of air after aspirating bile just to make sure that you have reached above the stricture now most important message here is do not put a metal stand for pre operative drainage because the surgeon finds it very difficult to remove the stand during the surgery because it tends to get embedded into the uh, bile duct wall now we come to the last part about the palliative biliary drainage so that is when the patient is considered unresectable for cure so the issues here are whether you drain only one lobe or two lobes now studies which were done around 20 years ago said that even if you drain 30% of the liver that is sufficient but recent studies have shown that you have to drain at least 50% of the liver parenchyma and this is done again in a multidisciplinary meeting you discuss with the radiologist see the liver volumetry and decide which part you want to drain because it is found out that if you drain 50% of the liver which may be done by either one stent or two stents in that case the risk for repeated the uh, need for repeated interventions is less the quality of life is better and uh, overall patient undergoing multiple procedures next issue is where you should put plastic stents or the metal stents now this depends on the expected patient survival if the survival expected is and plastic stents are a low cost option but if the patient is likely to survive uh more than 3 months then you are uh, better off putting a metal stent for hyler blocks always we put only uncovered stent because if you put covered stents you are going to block the openings of the other bile ducts now ercp stent is better for type 1 type 2 and in very expert units even type 3a they can do it by ercp but generally it is assumed is part of the european guidelines that type 3 and type 4 are better tackled by ptvd now what are the strategies done to improve outcome of stenting there are new changes in design to improve the stent patency to re reduce the migration of stents it can be uh, anchored by putting double pigtail stents people are doing rfa ablation of the stricture and then putting stents to increase the uh, stent patency now these are some of the examples in the upper part there is type 1 type 2 and type 3a and stenting has been done in the lower part is type 3a stricture and three metal stents have been put again there is type 3a and three plastic stents are put in the upper part and the lower uh, illustration shows that even if it is type 2 only endoscopically only right side could be drained and for left side you need ptbd these are two stents side by side on one side is uh, stent by the side of stent and on the right side is stent in stent or the y type of stent now this is the new kid on the block these things have developed in the last uh, few years eu has guided biliary drainage so instead of doing ptbd when you are unable to cannulate the papilla or there is no access to the papilla 
you can puncture the bile ducts either from the stomach the left side uh, and either put a guide wire then take the guide wire from the papilla and do a proper ercp stenting or you can do a hepatico gastrostomy so just drain the left hepatic duct into the stomach you can also do a randevu or a colodoco duodenostomy so put a stent into the duodenum by puncturing the bile duct by endoscopic ultrasound guidance so with these methods uh, in future at least some patients who need ptbd can be converted to endoscopic but number one is the expertise to do eus guided biliary drainage is not easily available second is there is also some complication rate to uh, eus guided procedures so this is my last slide uh, if you have a hyalur biliary obstruction first thing is do a staging is surgery feasible yes so if surgery is feasible then see whether there is cholangitis or whether the predicted uh, remnant liver volume is sufficient uh, if there is need for pre operative stenting then see whether the papilla is accessible if papilla is accessible then ercp with plastic stent is the best option if the papilla is not accessible do a ptbd remember endosco endosono guided uh, drainage is not recommended for pre op drainage because you are traversing tissue planes and there is risk of dissemination of the malignancy so eus guided drainage is only for a palliative purpose so if surgery is not possible is the papilla accessible yes then again ercp with either single stent or double stents if papilla is not accessible then one can do either ptbd or eus guided drainage so we do not want to just keep on shooting and destroy most of the thing that are in our site because that is not the purpose of managing proximal hyalur cancer you may uh, treat the patient but the outcome is not going to be good so don't be in a hurry to either stent or to operate so either thing can be risky for the patient you still need to look at the picture of bradley cooper and say that i'll check 10 things before i actually make the shot thank you